Hi, and welcome back to the Mom Mentality Show. I'm Chris Lucian, and I'm here with Austin Chadwick. And today we have Mark Pearl to talk about uh, his mob programming journey, uh, tools for getting past the grown zone and uh, reverting to old ideas or old habits, rather. Um, but first, before we get into all of that, Mark, uh, can you introduce yourself and, and talk a little bit about how you uh, how you got into everything? Yeah, sure. Um, hey, everyone. So um, if you're trying to place the accent, I am South African born, New Zealand based. Um, so I call myself a Siwi. That's a South African Kiwi. Uh, I've been um, in New Zealand for the last uh, six years, but um, spent most of my life in South Africa and in that area. And, and just excited to spend some time with uh, you, Austin and Chris, uh, I've um, been stalking you guys online for a number of years, so it's great to to actually talk. <laughs> all right, very flattered. Uh, <laughs> thank you very much. Um, all right, so uh, you know, let, let's get started. Let's get into it. Uh, what what started you mobbing? You know, how did that evolve? Uh, yeah, you know. Yeah, sure. So. My, my journey with my programming, you know, um, I guess I, I'd been in software, for, well, I've been in software for over 20 years now. So early on in my career, it was all about solo coding and, and working on your own. And um, about 10 years in, I joined a, a company called uh, Driven Alliance and part of their interview process they paired me up with somebody else and um, that was my first introduction to pair programming and extreme programming and, and that really blew my world at the time like I just uh, that, that first pairing activity I learned so much from uh, my pair partner and so I'd been pair programming for a number of years before I got introduced to mob programming. And the, the first real exposure I had in mob programming was when I went to the US um, to attend Agile Roots. And, and something I do when, when I like to travel is I like to, well, I was calling it team tourism or tech tourism, but the, the idea is basically uh, to spend time at different companies and, and see how they do things uh, and try to learn from that. And I, I spent two days at a company called Pluralsight and, and they were using mob programming and it was just, it just blew my mind at the time to, to see how they were working. And, and that then kind of introduced me to the idea of mob programming and, and that was really the start of it. So um, it was just, a almost life-changing experience in my professional career <laughs> ironically awesome uh so so did you so, so you went and you saw it and then you came back uh, is it do you just introduce it to your team right away how, how did they react what was the, how did that yeah all... so so what interested me at pearl site was the i i had come in with no understanding of their code base, um, just basically off the street. And within a day, um, I had been actively contributing to that team. And it had just been like, the work was just flowing. Like the, I, I talk, of, I'm a big fan of flow and, and just like, what's the most important thing that we need to get through. And when I saw that at Pearl site, that was, I was like, that's a really important concept. So, so I was in a team back in South Africa that was doing a lot of pair programming. And we were lucky enough that we had a lot of autonomy on our practices. So they gave us a lot of room to, to basically try new things. And so when I got back to South Africa, I had a brief conversation with one of uh, the, the manager of the team. And then the, the couple of days later, I snuck my uh, 
I stuck my screen, my TV screen into the office and we, we put up a bunch of desks uh, or a bunch of chairs and we started trying it out. Uh, and, and that's how we got mob programming going in there. Um, what, what was cool was we all saw the benefits pretty early because of our experience with pair programming. And pretty soon after that, we had ordered two very large screen displays and reorganized the office to to go around um, to support mobbing in that area. And that, that, that was a fairly easy transition into mob programming um, at my office. And then from there, it was really going, well, we were seeing the benefits of it in our own space, but how how could the rest of the industry benefit from mob programming in South Africa? So what what was fun was um, sharing it in, in the wider community there and kind of seeing different people take that and how that kind of had this network effect of different groups in South Africa mob programming. So it, it was a fun experience. Interesting enough, I don't think that the, the team that is in mobs anymore, uh, a couple of years later, management changed and there was some questioning around was this the was this in a cost effective way of mobbing and I'm, I'm i'm not sure where they landed but i knew that there are a couple conversations a few years later around do we still work this way or not yeah uh, you know i was about to say that often um the the financial discussion needs to happen on some level uh and uh you know typically uh you know, one of the questions that I get a lot from from, from people is like, how, how do you explain the financial benefits? And uh, and there are many, and but uh, and you you have to kind of avoid getting too technical while having these conversations. Um, and uh, so so um, they were still mobbing by the time you had moved on at that point, right? Um, yeah. Uh, are, are you still doing mobbing? Did that carry over to your next? Uh, <laughs> Yes. Yeah, so like so after, after that, we, uh, as a family, we, we immigrated to New Zealand. Um, and I joined a company in New Zealand that uh, hadn't done mob priming before and, and really just started sharing uh, the practice of mobbing there uh, and did a. Uh, so we saw a lot of support from. We did a lot of mobbing in, in the team that I was in at that point. And then I guess I did a, a little bit of a career transition where I moved from being a software engineer to focusing on how to grow new people and how to bring people into tech and really looked as at mob programming as a way to enable some of that early learning. So Mob programming has moved around, but I've seen in, in New Zealand, at least in Auckland, it's definitely spread to a, a number of different companies. There's a, a lot of support for it in some of the bigger tech organizations. And nowadays I don't, I, I don't actively code. I, I manage teams and people, um, but I'm very conscious around trying to create an environment that can support these different ways of working and um so so that that is always where, where i where i work right now i remember uh the first day i walked in the head of product said oh are you the person <laughs> that's <laughs> why have you introduced this mob programming we used to be able to get teams to do so many different things and and now they they um they're, they're all only working on one thing um <laughs> so <laughs> usual I, I, usual I conversation i think that's pretty that's an interesting question <laughs> i um so so my thoughts on that and my response was we're about enabling teams to do their best work yeah. right so you you don't go told doctors how to how to work on a patient you you enable them to to do that we we, we need to trust that people are not trying to be 
um, that their intentions and, and that they're going to use the right or best approach that they can to solving problems. And, mm -hmm. and so I, I just wanted to move the conversation away from the how um, to the what are we trying to achieve and what's important. Yeah. Um, and I, I think that's where, like, if quality is important, um, hey, there's a really strong argument for some of these practices that, in, in my mind, significantly improve quality. If uh, predictability is important, and, and often it is, predictability is a stronger um, guide than speed. If predictability is important, practices like mob programming, pair programming are, are really, really beneficial because they, they bring that stability and that flow that we look for that, that leads to you being able to set an expectation and meet it because you've got all the skills, you've got backups, you've got people working together. So, so that's where I normally like to go in it is instead of let's not think of just the dev time, let's think of the the whole life cycle and, and, and what we're trying to achieve from that. Cool. Cool. Yeah. And I, I have a lot of questions cause you've, uh, you've inspired a lot of, uh, uh, thoughts for me in uh, in the show and then also in your your writings on mobbing. But uh, one thing that just uh, came up from what you were just talking about is since you've more transitioned into a kind of leadership role um, and you're trying to uh, create a culture where teams do their best work, um, uh, how do you do that? Like, uh, what, are, what are some things you do to establish that culture? Yeah. Uh, so... <laughs> I'm by no means an expert in this, and this is, uh, I guess this is something that I'm growing and learning a lot around. There, there are a couple things I find important. I'm trying to encourage an intent-based culture. So state your intent and then don't wait for permission. Go ahead and do it as long as you understand like what are we what are we trying to achieve? What what does success look like? That's much better than a permission based culture where you've got to ask, please, can I do this? Can I do that? That's just a very ineffective way of, of doing things. I th I think communication is just so hard to get right and, and such a, a complex thing, but trying to communicate openly so that we understand what's the mission, like what's working, what isn't working. Um, I guess very cliche around creating a safe environment. You know, everybody says these things, but these aren't easy things to create. Um, and, and people from different backgrounds. And I think this is something I've learned is kind of your culture of where you've grown up comes into the mix and that adds another layer of complexity around it. But, um, from from a leadership side, trying to be clear on why we're doing things, uh, what are the boundaries, and, and then trying to give as much autonomy to the people within those boundaries, uh, I think gives a lot of good results. Nice, nice, yeah. That uh, yeah, that resonates uh, really uh, a lot with me and. Uh, yeah, so thank you for sharing on that. Uh, to kind of switch topics a little bit, um, uh, I will mention that uh, uh, Mark has written a book on uh, mob programming. <laughs> and one of the things uh, that I noticed in the introduction and uh, is that you, you know it, part of the intent of the book was to help people get past uh, what you call this grown zone here. So uh, yeah, what are you talking about here? <laughs> so. So the grown zone for me was, um, it. I think conceptually in, in my mind, we, we often talk about divergent and convergent thinking. Yeah. So so when we're trying to solve a problem, we, we diverge initially. And then at some point, as we collaborate, we converge on the solution and, and we move forward. And, and and that makes a lot of sense, but when you try to put that into practice, you often see that um, when you're diverging, you never 
sometimes depending on the people and the problem that convergence is really hard and, and conversations often go round and round people get emotional they get exhausted they keep repeating the same thing they don't feel heard they don't feel seen and understood and, and that for me is the groan zone mm. the, the groan zones that miss a messy in between between divergence and convergence um, and, and i see that a lot in mob programming especially for people that are new to it um, when when you haven't worked collaboratively you, you you're used to being the decider and making the decisions on your own and, and making the calls and and all of a sudden now you've got to work with these other people and they're going to have different opinions on on what's the right way or what's a good way to go through things and so that groan zone is very easy to get to uh when mobbing mm. um I th th there are there are a number of techniques I think that can can help to get through the grind zone. And um, oh, there was a really good book I read. Uh, it was called "The Facilitator's Guide to Collaborative Decision Making." Mm -hmm. uh, I don't know if you've ever seen that or read that, but that was um, the guy that wrote that. Basically, he had no association with technology whatsoever so he was approaching it more from a uh he was the guy that would be brought in if like two countries were at war <laughs> and you know they're trying to navigate um to to get to a good place so i figured that you know if somebody can can work through that sort of a grown zone um they should have some pretty good techniques and uh he actually he touched on a couple things but first of all writing things down so that like we were visually clear on like what are we actually saying um makes a lot of sense and, and something that i've seen and wanted to bring into mobbing so you, you know with with me one of the most important things in mob programming is the whiteboard or the shared space where people can put ideas or thoughts and you can look at that and um examine that because often when you say things what you say and what people hear aren't always the same thing but when it's right there and you can visually look at it it just realigns us to it so so that was one thing that has just been really really useful i think i think another thing with the ground zone is actually a, a tool like gradients uh, and, and gradients of agreement um, was a technique that um, was shared in that book uh, where, where effectively you're trying to move past a yes or no to get to the nuances of a decision. Because when, when, we, when we look at questions, they aren't often binary. There, there's often certain degrees and uh, there's like, well, I'm 100% committed to that direction, or I kind of think that's a good idea, or I'm on the fence, or I think that's terrible, or hey, if we do that, I'm never going to talk to you again. So, so we often try to boil that down to a yes, no, when there's a spectrum of feelings on that. And, and, and gradients was a, a technique that I've used ever since that's really helped getting through the grind zone. Um, and quite simply, like at its simplest form, you can go, um, let's say, and I'll use an arbitrary example. Um, I want to go to place X for lunch. Uh, if that's a team decision and you go, should we go there for lunch? Yes, no. Um, you are going to get people that may or may not strongly want to do that or not. So. Uh, in a mob, we would just use like a hand signal. It'd be like on a scale of one to five, where like five is you really, really want to get uh, go, and one is like you absolutely don't. Um, how do you feel on X? And everybody would just put their hand up, and on the count of three, you you put your number, and, and that really gives you a a sense or a heat map of of how you feel on that decision. And I found that that like tools like that help when you're in these trickier conversations to 
to navigate the crowd and get a sense of where people are at. Um, I don't know if that makes sense or if you guys have used something similar. Yeah, I think I've uh, called that uh, the fist of five uh, is yeah. it's kind of a thing. And um, yeah, it's, you know, I, I didn't know that particular origin of that technique, but I had encountered it at some point and started using it fairly often. But yeah, the, the heat mapping it kind of has to be at the same time. Uh, almost yeah. like if somebody's playing rock, paper, scissors, they have to decide beforehand what they're going to do before they show. Um, yeah. And that's been really good. Uh, yeah, I've I've used it too. And I, and I guess for me, what I'm curious is I've seen it help and I'm trying to figure out why does it help? Why does that help the group move forward? I don't know. What are your thoughts there, Mark? <laughs> um, so as somebody using gradients, what I use that too is to navigate a conversation. Mm. So, um, and, and I think like a, a one to five is like the simplest form, but some more advanced gradients or when you actually put expressions against the numbers um, because then you can go like uh, and I actually <laughs> I, I have a couple of gradient examples on URLs so that when I'm in a meeting I just go uh, goa.markperl.co.za and then it pulls up a gradient and you can kind of see a spectrum but um, okay. What, what, what that allows you to do then as somebody asking the question is navigate where people are at and try and understand um, their perspectives. Uh, and, and so when you have like these more developed gradients, you can see who's on board and, and who has real concerns. And then the conversation, uh, and clearly I'm not going to use gradients to pick where I want to go for lunch because that's arbitrary and, and overkill but but on really important decisions um, having everybody on board or knowing where people are sitting and then going well what would move you from a two to a three is a much better question than yes or no mm. and, and, and so you can kind of navigate that mm. so, so that's how I've seen the benefit of it the other thing that I've seen often is the same words mean different things to different people. And so when there's the question, there's like my immediate response. And then once we've kind of navigated that conversation, I understand what you meant by that. And that can often lead to, to a better alignment. Yeah, yeah. And I can definitely see how that helps, right? Because it gives you, it gives you, um, <laughs> smaller steps before like reaching the top of the hill right because sometimes if you're in that groan zone you're talking about it almost feels like we we all have to like instantly leap a thousand feet into the air to get to the top of the mountain to decide right and so these give kind of give you like footholds to walk up uh, walk up it because uh, it gives you something particular to talk about and walk through and I guess I could see why you would just feel like ah I'm just I'm done I'm out of this I'd rather go back to arguing with Chris over uh, pull requests as opposed to, <laughs> yeah. I don't know where to go from here. We just seem to be at an impasse, right? Where if you're like, well, what would bring me from a two to a three on this is, uh, you know, that that can really lead to some deeper understanding. And I think a lot of good mobbing that I've seen is a lot of do both and a lot of blending of ideas, right? And I, if I think back on all like the mobbing decisions I've made, a lot of the really good ones were where I either wasn't on board and someone changed the experiment slightly. So it brought me from a three to a four and that turned out to be a really good thing or we tried it, you know? Um, yeah. And I think that experimentation, like, well, yeah, like not being married to the code and going, we'll, we'll just try it. And if, if yeah. it doesn't work, we'll, we'll revert it. You know, like yeah. I, th I think there's a lot to that. Um, and, and so that's another technique, you, you know, that uh, we'll, we'll use in mob probing at least in the places that um, I've worked. We'll, we'll do these throwaway, throwaway sessions where we're like, hey, we're just going to try this for the next 45 minutes or, or whatever. And then we're just going to reset hard and see what we learn from it. Um, I, I I think that being married to the now that I've typed it, I've I've kind of committed the you know sunk cost fallacy. Um, just 
doesn't lead to a good outcome, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, I want to I want to go back to something you said earlier. Uh, it's this is probably um, a bit of a hard tangent at this point. Uh, <laughs> the um, when you mentioned tech tourism earlier, I found that pretty interesting. Yeah. Um, I know that we've done visit. You know, we talked about visits and and uh, you know I I I know people from uh, Plural Site kind of doing those things, but uh, maybe, maybe you could talk a little bit more about that because I, I thought that. I think it's a really healthy thing for people to be doing. And I think a lot of the, a lot of the people that, that just create a lot of ideas um, end up doing that sort of thing. Like what got you into that and what? Um... Yeah. So, so my underlying thought around it was that um, people all over the world are doing brilliant things and, and it's just different things. And, and so um, being intentional about visiting somewhere else and spending time with them allows you to kind of absorb some of the brilliant things that they are doing. Now, um, when I've tried to do that, I, ironically, like if it's not a very collaborative environment, so if people are working solo, the, the best that you can get is like a 15 minute tour and, yeah. and then then that's about it, right? You, you don't really See, know what much our that. like, and yeah, yeah exactly. no idea about what they do or how they work around it. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. When, um, when people mob and pair, it, it changes the game a little bit because now you can work with them on a problem and you, you, you might not understand the domain at all, but there's tools, there's techniques, there's, just how how somebody thinks all of that can come out of that um i i wouldn't have learned about mob programming if i hadn't had spent those two days at pearl site mm -hmm. um or at least i wouldn't have i wouldn't have been sold in it as much uh if i hadn't have had that experience um i think their uh test driven development was another example if i hadn't appeared with somebody on it and seen how they did it uh Conceptually, it made sense, but until you do it, you don't know. And when you see other people doing it, it can give you a lot of like uh, affirmation that that's possible and that's doable. So, so that's the, the the team tourism idea. And we 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 tried to, we we thought of like, hey, wouldn't it be great like if we could identify all the companies in the world that would be willing to like. Uh, do this and almost do like a passport and you can go to different places and yeah. uh experience that, I I, that idea. <laughs> I, i've never been able to get that to to get off the ground but i think uh i don't know if you guys know Corey Corey haynes mm. he he did that whole journeyman tour. oh yes yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, yeah 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 okay and, and i think um his experiences there that's almost like team tourism on steroids, you know, yeah. where you just kind of move from place to place and um, learn from it. Unfortunately, I think that's only possible at certain ages. With um, it's a lot harder when you're married with kids, <laughs> <laughs> and you, your stage of life is a little bit different. But um, I just think there's so much you can get from that, right? Mm -hmm. um, so fantastic. yeah, so that was the idea and. And, yeah, yeah, that's all. Uh, I guess um, for somebody that's trying to mimic what you did, uh, do you have any thoughts about like how they would get started with this? I, I think some, you know, I, to some it may seem, you know, like how would I even get invited to do something like that, or what, you know? Yeah. What would you tell them? Um, I think it's so. So part of it is just networking and um getting to know people in the community and so uh i think opportunities to visit places and learn from them starts from just broadening your network so i would say the first thing is find out your local tech community or conference or um something like that um the second part around it is like how do you actually get the time to do it um and I, I was the Pearl site one was lucky because I was traveling to a conference. So I had a couple of days 
um, that I took leave, but it was coming out of my own my own time, right? I was mm -hmm. I was um, putting time on that. So I think there is a conversation if you're employed by somebody else, like what are they willing to support and stuff. I think if you're employed for like a larger organization, there's actually a, um, a lot of merit in internal team tourism and just being really intentional about moving from different teams, even in the same building. You know, you know, there's there's a there's a lot there that we just don't do. So, um, I. It starts with a desire and then being creative and how to how to make that work. But yeah, that's fantastic. Um, uh, we we had uh, well, we've had a number of people that have done this, but um, you know, so, some of the associate level developers that we've had in our environment very deliberately, you know, spent a year at one on one product and then moved to another, and spent a year there and moved to another, and 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 went to all the different products that they could and worked on all the different product teams. That was very interesting uh, for them, yeah. and, and I think they developed very quickly because of that. Um, and uh, yeah, so uh, <clears throat> in the interest of time, uh, let's talk a little bit about reverting to old habits. Yeah. Um, so what what I've noticed with a lot of these practices is uh, people find out about them. They're interested to try them out they they try them they're like blown away wow this has changed how we work or this has made such a big difference and then you get there six months later and they're they're back to what they were doing before and like oh, what what happened um and, and for me it's just this um concept of entropy which which is we we basically revert back to uh, a state of chaos or ease if we're not putting effort or, or intentionality into it. Um, and so I, I think that that happens with mob programming. It happens with any of these things that require um, some effort and intentionality. Um, entropy is just uh, <laughs> and on so many levels, fitness, health, uh, we see it everywhere. Um, mm -hmm. And, and and so it's like, well, how do you how do you make something stay? Like, what? How do you how do you make this part of a a, a longer term change rather than a short experience? Um, and I, I think often it's about thinking or well, being intentional up front about why why were you doing this in the first place and, and being really clear on that. So. Um, you know, we, we get these techniques in life as well, where like, what am I wanting to achieve? What, what was the state right now? What am I wanting to change? It's the same with practices like mob proming, like, right. It, it's really useful in my mind to, uh, before you start mobbing, l look at your environment and go, well, what, what are the problems that we're seeing? What are the challenges? Let's be clear on that. And then um, once you've done those things, once you've got used to the practice, look at the change and then just keep reflecting back, keep retrospecting on it. So, so that, I, I, I don't know, how have you guys seen old habits crop in with mob probing? Is, is that a thing uh, for you guys or is, yeah. is it now totally <laughs> instilled in so, so really... actually, I, I think just, you know, independently, I've had the exact same thoughts of entropy, like, you know, that, that's what I refer to it in my mind, you know, it's like, okay, it's mm. time to push back on the entropy. Uh, <laughs> yeah. um, and a lot of it, uh, I, I personally try and think of, um, you know, especially people that are really passionate, because, you know, there are, there are people that are passionate about XP, you know, Zanpan, you know, mobbing, et cetera, et cetera. There, there are people that will join a team, you know, just because they want to be on a team and, and they don't necessarily have uh, interest in what practices are used or they've been a, in a, a variety of practices and this is just another one, right? Yeah. Um, and so, uh, you know, I'm, I'm always personally very interested in kind of like self-sustaining, self-reinforcing systems. And um, 
And so uh, like causal loop diagramming for a team um, from the like fifth discipline um, sort of like systems theory uh, stuff. Mm. Um, it, you know, I, I think a lot about you know, what would it take to just prevent things from sagging, right? Like, <laughs> you know, practices, department style stuff, uh, learning, um, you know, and, and uh, I think some indications like from, from a leadership level also, like indications of this might be areas where like if, if, you know, opportunities for training or learning are just, are being passed on often, right? Yeah. Um, things like that, right? And, and so you can kind of see that, people may be like so you know heads down on the work that they're not looking up and resharpening the saw um and and so things like that but uh, yeah i think uh, yeah i, I yeah, really sounds... i relate pretty heavily to that <laughs> that sentiment yeah yeah i really like what you uh, put in your book about this where you say you know it, the example here is mobbing but establish if blank is still meeting your team needs and i think i think that's a really good checkpoint for anybody who feels like they've regressed uh uh, a C.S. Lewis book comes to mind called Pilgrim's Regress. And, uh, mm. <laughs> uh, but, but with this whole thing of like, uh, you know, you've like found your way and it's getting benefit, but then you've regressed. Right. And so um, I think like what you said about establishing, if it's still meeting your needs can help re-trigger and re-motivate. Cause what I've seen is the regress happens, whether it's diet, whether it's exercise, whether it's TDD, whether it's XP or whatever is, um, because the entropy state is good enough, right? Um, in yeah. many people's minds, like, ah, it's okay if we have 50 bugs. Nah, management doesn't seem to care too much, right? And so um, I think kind of revisiting the reasons why you did something can help reignite it. Um, and I think it's hard for me to describe in any other way, but it's just basically someone being uh, like I've heard it with TDD, like test infected. So maybe it's like mob infected, ensemble infected yeah. or something where they've felt the benefits so strongly that it's almost impossible to work any other way. And I kind of feel like that's happened to me. Like you throw me into a team and if there's a lot of lean waste going on, it's just, it's just like, I, I don't know if I can work this way, you know? And so I have to yeah. find a way to keep it going. And I think revisiting uh, for someone who's maybe not quite there revisiting like oh is having 50 bugs a month a big deal or not you know <laughs> well also uh yeah. you know you kind of remind me as well <clears throat> so um especially in the long term right so so yeah. global software development turnover on average is 20 percent, right so um you know you have a uh a 25 person team and you know it, you're you know, like have like four or five people turn over a year, right? And so, um, so that's just like built in entropy, right? So, so the market competition for software developers and everything like that. Um, so you're regularly going to be onboarding and offboarding people. And, you know, and so part of managing that entropy is also, um, being really intentional and aware of how onboarding and offboarding happens and 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 de-siloing and that's like where huge benefits come from from mobbing if you yeah. you know if you have turnover at all mobbing makes you extremely resilient to that yeah we um we just went through uh, well in new zealand we would say it's hyper growth but um or large growth we you know we basically doubling engineering every 12 months or whatever and so we went from 100 to about 200 people um in uh, probably 18 months yeah. there thereabouts um and it's just this like introduction of new people into the environment changes the environment so chris what you you're saying around onboarding uh we we had quite a strong culture or emphasis around mob probing. And then we go, well, half the people here uh, have never paired or never mobbed. And, and so it's just like, how do you, how do you make that easy, low effort? And how do you create that awareness and desire to try it? Yeah. Um, and, and I think that's where kind of my philosophy around these things has maybe changed a little bit when I would have in the past, for many years being like, I will only mob 
uh, or work in a team at mobs and, and and now it's like no i i see mob programming as a practice and should be used in appropriate situations and i see pair programming as a practice and i see solo programming as a practice and good teams and good individuals look at the problem and then look at the practices that, that solve that problem and so it's just like when you have an industry like ours where you, you know um it's growing and so there's so many new people coming in it's making them aware of the practices and giving them the options and getting them past just that shallow understanding to to get that nuance so so that onboarding and then kind of that generational pass it down and intentionality around sharing just um i see those as like really important elements in a company culture to just create a good environment if that makes sense i don't know yeah, yeah. And, and it's it's uh you know i've definitely seen teams where the onboarding and offboarding wasn't handled well and so when turnover happened it was devastating to the or yeah. the team right and and that's you know that's an area that's something that can be avoided by by having adopting a culture of learning um whether it's mobbing or not um, but just in general it's I think it's easier with mobbing, but <laughs> but uh, learning is important for sure. And yeah. we um we uh, just as like a side note, we actually had an, a a few people that burnt out, um, especially when we moved from co-located to remote through COVID and lockdowns. Because in New Zealand, we basically locked the country down, and um, I think we had several months where you were stuck at home, um, and so that culture I, I guess is like reinforcing the culture but then it's also being aware of like when these things can actually not be a good thing mm. and, and being conscious of that and so we at one stage where i worked like as a leadership group we we needed to start reinforcing hey we we encourage mobbing but be be aware that people need to have breaks and and sometimes need to be on their own and 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 support that as well um, just just to be aware be aware of the, the situation and the time yeah yeah and i really love what you said there where it kind of ties back into what you're saying and creating a certain kind of leader uh culture in, in with your leadership and that if you you know if you give a goal without a method as deming said it's cruel right um but also to give a method without a goal can be cruel, right? So if you just say like, oh, we're going to do this and they don't understand why. Um, but yeah. like if you create an environment where they're aware of practices like test driven development and mob programming and pairing and say, hey, here's a problem. And you all have the autonomy and the kind of intent based uh, style to figure out what, what works best for it. But at least they're aware of different methods to achieve the goals you know that that yeah. the organization has i think yeah i i, I think there's a, a, a nuance to that as well which is depending on where somebody's in their learning journey and growth journey the the approach has changed so so that yeah. aut autonomy and, and awareness for me comes at a certain level of maturity yeah um and and, and so there's there's a lot there um in, in what you've touched on but I'm conscious it's maybe another topic for another time. Yeah, no, that's great though. Yeah, yeah. So maybe we'll 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 go into the wax on wax off topic some other time. But <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, but we are at near time. And uh, so, is there anything you like to share a plug before we close out this episode? Um, no, I really just always interested to to learn from others. So please uh, reach out if um, we touched on something. Uh, that you had a different opinion on or also differently i think that's always useful um to see and uh i guess while i don't don't write books to make money if you are interested in uh a introductory level book to mob programming um i've got one that uh i think at least has shared my journey and my experience and keen to hear other people's thoughts around it yeah, fantastic. And I'll, I'll second that and that uh, we'd love to hear your uh, thoughts and opinions on these topics. Um, and uh, yeah, so YouTube, Twitter, LinkedIn, and more, we would love to hear it. 
And uh, yeah, regarding Mark's book, I'm partway through and I'm really enjoying it so far. So I'll, I definitely will second that plug. Uh, but yeah, uh, thank you all for your time. Thank you so much, Mark, for being on the show. This has been a fantastic discussion and learning. And uh, till next time, uh, everyone, have a good one and talk to you later. Bye. Bye, everybody. Bye-bye.